Hi, this is Randall Schwartz, host of Floss Weekly. This week, Dan Lynch joins me, and it's about time we had this show. This show is about time. It's about how your computer keeps track of time and synchronizes with everybody else's computer. It's about NTP. You're not going to want to miss this, so stay tuned. Netcasts you love. From people you trust. This is Twit. Bandwidth for Floss Weekly is provided by Cashfly at C A C H E F L Y dot com. This is Floss Weekly with Randall Schwartz and Dan Lynch. Episode 350, recorded on August 19th, 2015. NTP. This episode is brought to you by DigitalOcean, simple and fast cloud hosting built for developers. Deploy an SSD cloud server in 55 seconds. Try it today for free. Visit DigitalOcean.com, and once you sign up, be sure to enter the promo code FLOSS in the billing section for a $10 credit. And by PagerDuty. PagerDuty decreases alerting noise for IT operations and developers to ensure that the right engineers are notified at the right time. Increase your uptime and sign up for a 14-day free trial at pageduty.com slash twit. It's time for Floss Weekly, the show about free Libre open source software. I am your host, Randall Schwartz, Merlin at Stonehenge.com, bringing you each week the movers, the shakers, the big projects, the little projects, projects that you may be using every day and not aware of it, and now you're going to find out about it. I bet something like that's going to happen today. Each week, of course, I'm joined by a lovely and talented co-host this week, no exception, Dan Lynch. Welcome back to the show. Hello, Randall. Good to be back. And, and where are you speaking to us from? It doesn't look like your normal studio. <laughs> It's not now. Uh, I'm usually locked away in a dark cave somewhere, but I'm uh, I'm in the light now after much adjustment of the computer. Uh, I'm in France, actually. I'm on holiday in France. I'm near um, about two hours from Bordeaux, just inland. Uh, and thankfully, I'm in the rural French countryside. And uh, all being well, the internet will keep the inter- gods of the internet will keep uh, keep shining on me. Right. Very cool. Very cool. And I, as some of you may see by if you're watching the video, I'm back at ZipRecruiter after two months of absence from here. It was conference season. So I was stuck going here and there. And I just got back from a two week cruise uh, to Iceland and uh, Norway. And if we have time at the end of the show, I'll talk a little bit more about that because it was a lot of fun. And two weeks on a cruise ship is a new record for me. A lot of fun with that, too. So uh, I'm in uh, their Santa Monica headquarters once again. And uh, hopefully I have a really good net connection here as well. So, of course, the show isn't this week in where the hell are the guests the show is <laughs> is uh, uh, the show is in fact about open, open source software and this week is no exception to that and i'm actually really excited about this week's episode so uh those of you that are listening or watching uh look at the device or at least think about the device that you're listening from it knows what time it is how does it know what time it is you didn't enter the time unless you had a really, really old device or something. How does it know? It does it by talking to other computers that do know what time it is. But how do they know what time it is? That's really an interesting problem. What solves it for the entire Internet is the world's oldest continuously running application on in the world called NTP, Network Time Protocol. And we have the current shepherd of the NTP project, uh, the president of the Network Time Foundation, Harlan, uh, forget that, sorry, Harlan Stan. I actually had to look. I'm sorry, Harlan. Uh, but uh, we're going to bring him on and talk about the history of NTP, what's currently happening, maybe what the future things are about it, uh, some related projects perhaps, and a little bit of Harlan's background as well, because it turns out that I, I overlap Harlan's background in a few other interesting ways. So this is going to be a very fun, fun show and probably be geeky and probably run long. We'll see if we have time to finish all my questions on this. Uh, Dan, what do you know about NTP? Uh, well, the main thing I know about NTP is it, it, it just works. I mean, it, it always works for me. I've never had a problem with it. So, uh, I mean, I've never had cause to kind of look into it much more. But it's particularly good for us, obviously, because we're in you're in America on the West Coast. I'm now in France. Uh, but uh, obviously, we were able to quickly work out what time it was through, through NTP with our time zone differences and stuff. So, uh, very useful for us. Yeah, I mean, given that first hop latency is typically, you know, uh, something on the order of five or ten milliseconds, even to your local router, and then there's even more and more as you go further down, 
NTP still manages to keep your time accurate to within probably a fraction of a millisecond. And this is amazing. This is just truly amazing to me. So I am going to geek out on this show absolutely for sure. But before we get started, I have a very important message. Uh, whether you're an experienced code warrior or just getting started, you need flexible, reliable, and affordable hosting. DigitalOcean provides developers with droplets, which are virtual private servers that can be customized and deployed quickly to host websites, web apps, production applications, personal projects, virtual desktops, and almost anything else you can think of with full root access. I myself am a DigitalOcean customer. I found out about them back in February at uh, uh, scale um, because they were handing out coupons for $10 uh, credit, which is really cool. And they're running FreeBSD now. That's my favorite operating system. And finally, a hosting service that gets me running FreeBSD on their droplets. DigitalOcean is built for developers. It's used by over 400,000 of them, like I said, including me. You can choose your OS, Ubuntu, CentOS, Debian, Fedora, CoreOS, and FreeBSD. That's me as well. One-click install allows you to quickly deploy apps like Django, Docker, Drupal, LAMP, GitLab, MediaWiki, Node.js, WordPress, Ghost, Magento, own. Cloud, Ruby on Rails, and more. And all the servers are built on hex core machines with dedicated ECC RAM and RAID SSD storage. Yes, no hard disk. It's all SSD. Uh, servers can have up to 20 CPUs, 64 gigs of RAM, and 640 gigs of SSD hard drive space. You have full feature DNS management you, to easily manage your domains or use dedicated IPs. And it's so easy to get started. You can deploy an SSD cloud server in as little as 55 seconds. When you sign up, it's like 55 seconds later, your machine is running. I know because my first machine came up that quickly. So DigitalOcean has incredibly affordable and straightforward pricing. Servers start at only $5 per month. And it's actually a pretty beefy machine, even at $5. There's also hourly pricing available starting at less than a penny per hour. But we're going to make it easy so you can get started today and deploy an SSD cloud server for free. Visit DigitalOcean.com and create an account. Once you confirm your email and account information, go to the billing section and enter the promo code FLOSS for a free $10 credit. So you can run two months on that one machine. That's plenty to get started and explore what DigitalOcean can do. That's DigitalOcean.com. And once you sign up, enter the code F-L-O-S-S -S in the billing section for a $10 credit. And we really thank DigitalOcean for their sponsorship of Floss Weekly. And now let's go ahead and bring on our guest. Harlan, welcome to the show. Thanks, sir. Randall, it's good to see you finally. <laughs> yeah, okay. And uh, where are you speaking to us from? Talent, Oregon. And that's uh, down in the southern end of the state, right? Yes, sir. It's right up I-5 uh, over the California border. Yeah, in between Ashland, Oregon, home of the Oregon Shakespeare Festival, and Medford, Oregon, which is the biggest community down here with a couple hundred thousand people in it, well, Great. in the metro area. Wonderful, wonderful. Well, I gave my impression of what NTP does for me, but why don't you go ahead and give us the 30,000-foot overview? What is NTP and why is it important? NTP keeps the clocks right on computers, and it does this based on the premise, speaking for... If I'm speaking for the machine, NTP works on the premise that I'm saying I want to know what time it is. I'm going to ask other sources what they think the time is. And based on how many answers I get, I'll decide if they're saying and follow the best idea I can of what time I believe it to be from looking outside me. Well, you know, back in the early days, I knew that you could do some sort of, um, like, like I used Telnet to, Telnet to a port. It told me what time was on the other machine. Why yes. do we need NTP on top of that? Because there's if, if you go to Telnet to, to the time port, you don't know what's – there's going to be delay in latency. Telnet ha, uh, TCP has retry and doesn't – and it gets messy. So the beauty of doing time with UDP packets is there's no retransmissions and you can get the time much better. Back in the early days when Dave Mills first started to work on this, we, he considered himself lucky if he could get a machine to follow accurate time to within a tenth of a second or so. And we knew we could do better as time went on and we learned to distinguish the different sorts of, of jitter and noise that were in a signal. Uh, and to everybody's credit, we've got that down from the millisecond range, uh, I'm sorry, to the tenth of a second range, down to the easily the millisecond range for LANs and the microsecond range if you need to. And with other protocols, including NTP, using uh, some other techniques, NTP or precision time protocol, PTP, we can get time synchroni synchronization down to a handful of nanoseconds. Wow, that is purely amazing. So, so as I said in the opening of the show, you know, your first hop or second hop might be in the order of milliseconds. 
my understanding of NTP, and you can correct me, I'm, I'm going to do sort of the high-level hand-waving, is that I send out a packet uh, and I have my timestamp in it, then you get it and you add your timestamp to it and send it back. And then I can there use the two other timestamps to figure out how long it took to get there. Is that, is that a good overview? That's close. The, the final timestamp packet you get has uh, four timestamps in it. T1 is the time you sent it. T2 is the time I got it. T3 is the time I sent it back to you. So if you subtract T3 from T2, you're going to know how long I processed it. And ah. T4 is the time you received it. And so you can do some interesting things with subtraction there. And if you assume a symmetrical connection, you can then say the delay for you to send it to me was the same as the delay for me to send it back to you. And you can go ahead and use that to calculate the time. And it doesn't matter if my clock's ahead of yours or if your clock's ahead of mine or uh, – our clocks are running at slightly different speeds. If you if you do these things often enough, it's possible to take the information and make sure that you can steer your clock toward where you want it to be. Okay, but as you said also in the opening, your first description of it, you also want to see how the other system is sane. Is this why I have multiple NTP connections going on? Absolutely. And uh, if, if you only talk to one source of time, you're going to believe it. You have nothing better to do. And we're going to start to broach on these topics a bit later, I suspect. One of the problems people have is if you – this is a Byzantine general's problem. If you, if you want to guard against one insane general, you better have at least three generals to talk to. Uh, so you're looking at 2N plus 1. And – if you've got, if you think there may be two insane folks out there, you better make sure you've got uh, five people to talk to, so that the other three can outvote the insane ones. Okay, that's pretty awesome. Um, and uh, now, when, okay, but getting, I'm sorry, I'm going to do this. Go ahead. So Please. then it makes sense to say, great, I'll get three, and that's fine until one goes insane, and then the other two don't agree close enough on what time it is. So then you decide four is a good number, except if you have two groups of two, you don't know what time it is, and if you have five. The question is, how many servers do you really want? And the shorter answer is, it depends on how critical time is to you. And if it's really critical, just have more. This is not a heavyweight protocol. Okay. But so, so my, my system's talking to the next system. The next system's talking to the next system. Uh, somebody has to know the truth ultimately. How does that happen? The easy answer is, sooner or later, you're talking to stratum zero time, which I will... Uh, I hope not offensively to anybody, call that God time. And that's what people, that's what I consider to be running up on the GPS satellites or, you know, in, I, I'll call it in the belly of places like here in America, NIST or U.S. Naval Observatory. There's similar time labs in Canada and Germany and Japan and Switzerland and probably 80 countries out there that have their own national time labs. The problem there is they all have to agree on when the stroke of the second is. And now that we've progressed to the point where the time, where the standard for a second is, is the frequency of a cesium atom, and you've got 9 billion of those a second if I counted my number of zeros correctly, the question is 9 billion is a fairly fast thing to happen. You got to agree on where the uptick is, and if your uptick isn't the same as your neighbor's, well, you're off by nine billionth of a second. Who really cares? The answer is nobody, except for the people who really care about time. Uh, that's that tightly synchronized, and so, uh, for example, the Navy has forty some odd different. Uh, what do they call them? Time vaults, and these are environmentally controlled rooms with at least three uh, atomic clocks in them and a variety of other devices to make sure they measure how fast they're synchronized. And they use this to come up with the time for this particular vault, and then they take the time from these 40-some-odd different vault rooms, and they put them together on a paper clock, basically. And that's how the U.S. Naval Observatory decides what time it is. That's similar to what NIST is going to be doing and what the other folks are doing. And then these folks have their clocks all synchronized with each other to – and watch to see who's behaving well and who isn't. And you come up with a paper clock, which is a coordinated universal time. And that gets sent up and distributed to the GPS satellites for the GPS system and for the other satellites that are uh, time that, that 
need time. Well, that's a strange thing to say. All the navigational <laughs> satellites have to know what time it is because if you don't know what time it is and you don't know where your satellite is, you can't figure out where you are. Very good. So uh, you, also, so so I understand there's there's you can get like the the stratum, I think, uh, stratum one, I think you call it, where it's actually the original yes. source of N NTP stuff. Zero. Oh, that's zero. Oh, well, that the zero time is, is zero. the stuff that zero is the stuff I call zero god time. Right, and okay. everybody else tries to find that. So if I'm getting my time from an NTS, uh, from, from a GPS server, I'm running at stratum one because I'm one layer below God time. Right, okay. So the stratum one servers have like three options, right? They have WVH, radio signal, yep. they have GPS time, or they could be one of these guys attached to one of these, like the Navy, t Navy uh, time devices, right? Uh, or it could be that, you know, you're one of the, fortunate or crazy depend or crazy fortunate people who happens to have a you know a cesium time standard or a hydrogen uh, clock or something or even rubidium or something else that's running there that would be synchronized to it and uh, you can get your time from that and every once in a while you'll do something to make sure that your time source is properly synchronized to something else and then it gently drifts off based on temperature and and other interesting wobbles from uh, correct time. I'm going to drill just a slightly deeper down the rabbit hole here, and I'm, I'm now curious, how do those clocks get synchronized? I have never done it since I've <laughs> never been fortunate enough to be able to do it. At the time, most, most frequency standards and time standards will have a BNC connector on them. And I'm told what you would do uh, before a few years ago was you'd for example, drive the thing to the U.S. Naval Observatory, uh, pull up to a door, they'd snake a cable out to you, you plug it in, and you're synchronized. <laughs> now you probably have to call and set up an appointment for it. Wow. <laughs> wow. Okay. Okay. Let's, uh, let's come back out of the rabbit hole for a second. I want to know about the project now. How did you get involved with the NTP project, and what's your current role with it? Back in the... 80s, uh, it be, you know, as soon as we started using computers, we realized that timestamps were kind of useful because you can't tell when something happened if you don't know what the time was. And NFS came along, and that was a tr wonderful, glorious thing because disk drives were really expensive. And if I could share disk space from another machine, uh, that meant I didn't have to waste all that money because you know megabytes were were scarce in those days for for storage. Indeed, and then very quickly people realize that make is this truly wonderful tool that you can use to recompile things except if you've got your your files on one machine and you're on another and their clocks don't agree make isn't usually having a really good time so it became vitally important to try and synchronize the clocks of the machines on your network so things like make wouldn't screw up and you could keep using uh, network file servers um, so I was working on a bunch of projects where these things happened and, you know, folks were beginning to be curious about when did my email fail because I had, you know, you got to look in your logs, which means you have to see what the timestamps said they were. And I started working on projects where time synchronization was important and using NFS. And at the time, there were really only two useful ways to do that, running TimeD uh, and running NTPD. And I looked at the protocols and decided for me, NTPD felt like the right way to do it. It looked around to see what the best time was, and it followed its idea of the best time. As I recall, and I could be wrong about this, time D worked by looking around, seeing who you could find, and just following them no matter what anybody else said. Mm. And to me, that looked like a recipe for disaster. So I started running early NTP, probably NTP2, as I recall, um, because NTP1 didn't last all that long. NTP2 came out pretty soon thereafter, and it was followed within a year or so by NTP3. Uh, and I started submitting patches because I was also working on a growing number of different versions of the different flavors of Unix at the time. And every time I would bring some new system up because somebody wanted to port their software to, you know, if I was working for a software vendor, they wanted it to run on some brand new machine or some new version of Unix from some new vendor. I put NTP on it, find any portability mistakes and mail these patches back to Dave Mills. And that was not a lot of fun in those days because you'd grab the NTP tarball, unpack it. You had to edit a, a config file which got run through a sed processor, which changed all the make, fi the make file.tpl files 
which were the templates that make use to generate itself. And any time there was a difference in the way of library work, you had to add if defs to the code that would you know, compensate for this issue, and it got ugly, and it also meant you had to unpack a different version of the code for every machine. You had to patch each version and then try and synchronize your patches. So NFS became a really wonderful thing to do, and at the time, I was also uh, involved with Perl because uh, for those of us who go back that far, trying to do anything in different versions of shell or awk or grep or things it was a real pain. And when Larry got Perl invented, we went, this is really awesome. I can write this thing in one language that I can now move to all these different machines. And I'd start doing the same thing, sending portability patches back to Larry. And mm -hmm. he started the MetaConfig program. Uh, that's the configure script that, that Perl uses to decide what the local environment looks like. And it got to the point where I was submitting enough patches to that that Larry said, I have a really great idea. I'm going to go focus on Perl. You focus on MetaConfig. And I took this knowledge and, and used the problems that I was seeing on all these different versions of all these different operating systems to help MetaConfig do its job. And it made my life a lot easier when I would port NTP to a new platform. And about that time, um, GNU AutoConf came out. And GNU AutoConf was nice because it, it AutoMake started soon thereafter. And the one thing I got with AutoMake that I didn't get with MetaConfig was the ability to uh, build something in a subdirectory. And that was a lifesaver for me because that meant I could have a single copy of the source code. I would do all my builds for each different operating system in a different subdirectory. And when I made my patch for an operating system, I only made it once. And I could then go ahead and rerun these builds on all these other machines and instantly know if something broke without having a horrible maintenance nightmare. So um, I looked at this, saw that while MetaConfig was far more mature than AutoConf, AutoConf was starting to catch up and the ability to use AutoMake to build things once out of a single directory was just so compelling that eventually I sent Dave Mills a message saying, hey, I don't know if you've tried to install Perl lately. Uh, it's really swell. It's nice to just be able to type configure instead of manually editing a config template and you know running set on everything. And if you've ever had to build any of these, you know, the, the initial GNU packages, it's really nice to build in a subdirectory because you don't have to have a separate copy of the code everywhere. And this really resonated with Dave because he had a half a dozen or more different versions of, of SunOS running in other places. He had HP UX and uh, you know, a bunch of Ultrix machines and, and a lot of other esoteric type machines. And so he knew exactly the pain I was going through. And when I said, would you like it if I converted NTP to use AutoCon AutoConf, he said, sure, show me what you got. And I did. And a month or so later, I sent him the result. And he said, and he looked at it and said, this looks pretty good. Um, I went, great. What can I do to help? He said, well, uh, since you've already got that it's working, why don't you roll a release tarball for me? And I did. And I sent it to him. And he says, well, it's, it's a pain for you to do this and for me to reconcile it. Why don't I give you an account on my machine? I went, okay. And I started doing my work on his machine. And eventually, weeks later, something came up. And I said, great, Dave, I need you to become root and do this. And he said, well, how about if I just give you the root password? And I went, okay. He obviously trusts me. And the next thing I knew, you know, he'd said, well, while you were doing these things, I didn't want to step on your toes. So there's a bunch of bug reports in the mail queue over here. Would you mind applying them? I went, sure, no problem. And the next thing I know, I've become you know, I'll I became the babysitter for Dave's baby. And uh, that's pretty much what happened. And Dave turfed more and more things off to me that he didn't like doing. And sooner or later, I eventually became the project manager of NTP. And uh, I've sort of been doing that for the last 20 some odd years. So, Harlan, you mentioned you're the project manager. Are you, how many people are involved with, with NTP? Is it, is it just you? Are you like the benevolent dictator? Is there other people involved? How does that kind of thing work? There are a good number of folks who help out. There's probably a, uh, 
about a handful of people who dive into the code regularly and offer patches, and there's probably 30 other people, if not more, uh, who will work on very specific things. For example, there's three or four people who work on uh, one of the ref clock drivers, the parse ref clock drivers, which is one of the bigger ones. Uh, we just spun up, we've had at least two developers for the Encore driver, uh, and one of them seems to have gone dark, and I just spun up another one a week or so ago. There are other folks who care about reference clocks that their vent that their company produces, and so they'll do that. And I may not. T I will only talk to these people if there's a bug in their driver. So some of these folks I may not interface with more than once every year or three. But other folks, um, you know, I'll we'll chat with anywhere from daily to weekly or monthly, and. So that goes to the number of contributors. Uh, there are other folks who will focus on aspects of documentation or some of the scripting or other things. <clears throat> some people will also help out with some of the standards work uh, because the standards process for NTP is different from pretty much the standards for any other Internet effort. And I don't know which rabbit hole you want me to dive down next. So, <laughs> And I'm pretty sure I didn't answer all your questions either. So which direction do you want me to go? So I, I was curious, is, is Dave still involved, Dave Mills, in the project? Yes, he's still involved. The downside is Dave has vision problems and he can't look at the code anymore. So the trick is he has an incredible memory. And frankly, Dave is a super genius. So he knows what all the code does. He knows exactly why the algorithms were done the way they were done. And I talked to him not as often as I was like. It originally went from he and I would talk on the phone maybe once every three, four years or so. And now we're to the point where I try to talk to him at least every couple of weeks and more if I can. So uh, because there's this incredible knowledge there and he knows this is like uh, I remember seeing a, a story once about Boston where they occasionally have problems with water showing up in strange places. And when they can't figure it out, they go back to the really old maps from shortly after colonization where they would show pictures of hills and creeks and cow paths. And when all else fails and you don't know where the water's coming from, you pick up one of these maps and you can use it to find where the water's coming from. If you don't have people around who have that level of knowledge of history, you end up on some goose chases that are incredibly wild. So yes, having Dave Mills still around and, and the ability for me to, to call him and chat with him is a truly wonderful and glorious thing. Well, I think uh, that was a great answer, by the way. And uh, I know we have so much more to ask, but uh, right now I've got to, you know, run down to the uh, store and, uh, and and help pay for bills, I guess. Well, I wouldn't run down to the store to pay the bills. <laughs> Sorry about that. But we'll, we'll be right back to you in a couple minutes, Harlan, because PagerDuty is an operations performance platform that delivers visibility and actionable intelligence to help increase the uptime of your apps, servers, websites, and databases. If you rely on your software and services to always be up, PagerDuty is an essential tool. As the hub of your operations, PagerDuty connects all of your systems into a single view where you can see critical events across all your monitoring tools. Uh, there are over 100 ready-to-use integrations, including Nagios, New Relic, a Keynote, App Dynamics, or you can roll your own with PagerDuty's API. Incidents are automatically filtered and deduplicated to ensure only actionable alerts. And you can customize it to fit how you and your team work, regardless of location or size. So get the right engineer on the right problem at the right time. Visit pagerduty.com slash twit to sign up for a free 14-day trial. And for as little as $19 a month, you can increase your uptime with PagerDuty. And when you sign up for a new account, you can also get a free t-shirt. That's pagerduty.com slash twit. On Tuesday, August 25th at 10 a.m. Pacific, PagerDuty is having a free webinar on IT incident resolution in the enterprise. As IT organizations are getting larger and more complex, the tools and processes to manage incident response must be able to scale. In this webinar, they will be discussing best practice and share insights into how successful IT organizations are meeting the challenge. You can register now at pagerduty.com slash webinar. And we do thank PagerDuty for their support of Floss Weekly and other shows on the TWIT network. Very cool. So, uh, Harlan... Uh, uh, we were actually sort of curious. Um, uh, I forgot what we were curious about. Uh, Dan, I think you had the question. Uh, okay, yeah, uh, there we go. <laughs> so Randall's just caught me out there. Um, yeah, so um, we were talking about the project and who's involved and stuff. And um, you were saying about how, you know, you, you obviously there's a large user, there's a massive user base for this. I mean, everybody's using it, aren't they? Let's be honest. Hund hundreds uh, <laughs> of millions of machines, we think. Yeah. So does that does the size of the project ever cause a problem that you get so many uh, bug reports and so many feature requests and things that it's hard to deal with, or or is that okay? Is it manageable? 
Um, it would, the, the biggest problem we've got, well, let's put it this, let me start off this way. We're, I currently estimate that we're in excess of 3 trillion operational hours a year on the protocol and the software. So if people have problems, they're usually, they're pretty likely to, to step up and tell us about it. The short answer is this would be manageable if I had more competent help. Um, right now, uh, this sounds a little weird to say. Um, I'm putting in a stupid amount of hours. I'm, I've been putting in about 80 hour, over 80 hours a week on NTP alone for the last six or eight years. Um, and then there's the time I, on top of that I put into Network Time Foundation. And when I have at least one and preferably two really awesome developers working with me, we can make some amazing progress. Right now, I don't think I've got I don't think I have a half time, you know, half time worth of developers helping me out on this, uh, and so the bug numbers are going up. We had, you know, two hundred and some out a couple of years ago. It went up to three hundred. I think we've got three hundred and fifty to three hundred eighty open bug reports right now, and we slog through them as quickly as we can. But a lot of people think that you know, if NTP has been around this long, it must be solved and it must be done, and the. The amusing response I tell people is something uh, a friend of mine told me back in grad school. Software isn't finished until the last user is dead. So <laughs> there's always going to be something to do. And people just think that since it's been around this long, it just must work. Well, that's true. It does until something weird happens and you're the corner case nobody thought about. And somebody has to fix it. And you have to fix it in a way that you aren't creating problems for other people. And this goes to... Um, I really don't know if I want to step into this pile. Um, there are different mm. schools of thought about the different ways to to do open source projects. There are people who go for the bizarre approach and people who go for the cathedral approach. And um, in my experience, I've done them both, and I get irritated with the people who some of the people who use the cathedral approach, and I'm one of them. And I also see that the problems that are solved by the cathedral approach are far fewer than the problems created by the bizarre approach. Um, and so there are times I'll make a decision that will piss off a bunch of people because I'm solving problems they don't have. The problem is I'm solving higher level problems. I'm solving problems that affect people that no, that they may not see that you know group A may not see but group B sees and if and if the software doesn't fix it for everybody people don't use it and NTP for better or worse is a reference implementation we're trying to implement everything in the protocol spec that we can and make sure that we can find the better ways to do it and that can't be done if there isn't wide adoption and NTP works so well that people use it by default and the good news is that we're, we're coming up with ways to make it even more applicable to folks. I still have to deal with machines that are, you know, we still deal with implementations that are on embedded platforms that may not have floating point on them still. So we have to make sure floating point emulation works. And I've got other people who say, I really want NTP to work fine on my, you know, 12 core, my 12 core processor here. And I want to find ways to multi-thread it so we can get answers. And then you get to solve a huge number of problems trying to figure out what time is it on a multi-threaded processor where you can't just grab the time without doing some locking, which screws everything else up. So um, the short mm -hmm. answer is need a whole lot of help. And mm -hmm. the other problem is it's one thing to look at this and say, well, it's a piece of software. It isn't. It's a product. And a product needs more than just lines of code or something that addresses problems that people have on certain platforms. And uh, there are a whole lot of people who will do things like saying, well, I'd love to give you $5 if, if, if you'll promise to work on this piece with it, which is great. And I made a conscious choice not to take targeted donations for the foundation because if somebody gives me money for a targeted donation, that means I have to pay accountants to look to make sure that's where the money went and the developers have to punch time clocks because they have to account for where their time was spent because if you didn't spend your time on a project and account for that you can't make sure you build it to the right category and then that effect of which is if you give me ten dollars five dollars of it goes to overhead and five dollars of it goes to the work and it's 
worth it to me to tell people no at that point and say, if you want to give us money, give us money. We promise we'll do good things with it. By the way, here are all of our accounting records because we publish all those. And people can see where the money's being spent. And we don't, I mean, last year was our best year ever. Network Time Foundation brought in just over $100,000, which on the one hand is huge. On the other hand, to do this job right, you know, we're looking at budgets that are that are three to nine million dollars a year because we need to have 20 or 30 people spread out doing everything from development to documentation to QA and testing. Uh, if I want to have a PhD level scientist with with you know racks of with with time equipment and network simulators and a dedicated sysadmin who is not going to be cheap to help keep everything plugged in together with all these versions of different operating systems going, the money starts to add up. And you have to have things like a building to put these in, or at least, you know, a, a a spouse who's tolerant of your insanity. And it's you're paying for internet access and the cooling that you have to do. Uh, the mm. cost goes up. You got to document this so people can see it. So this isn't the sort of thing where people say, "Well, why the hell can't he just do this in his spare time for ten hours a week?" Mm. So um, and, uh, that's. To, Sorry, sorry, I don't, didn't want to cut in on you, but I, you just kind of answered something else that I was going to ask uh, a little bit. I was going to say, uh, going to ask because because everybody is using NTP and because it's around. And I've got to confess, when Randall told me we were doing a show on NTP, I had to look into it because I've always used it, but I've never had any special use case. So it's always just worked for me. I never really thought about it. Do people take it f for granted? Do they, do they just think, oh, it's it's there, it works? Like you said, it's done. It doesn't need to be fixed or, or anything. It's just there. It's the infrastructure of the network world that we live in. I think to answer the the best answer I have for your question in general, people don't even stop to think that it's there. They don't take it for granted. They don't even see it, and it isn't until you mention to them that it's there, and they go, "Oh yeah, that's there. Well, it works. So why does anybody need to do anything on it?" And they, and from that point, it's an educational process going to to show them why it isn't as easy as it used to be. Um, to take a step backwards into geekdom, you know, 20 years ago when Dave Mills wanted to have things work and he was happy to get clock synchronized to a tenth of a second, that was great because there were bits of noise and we had real phone systems that had real copper wire that went from here to there and electricity traveled along, you know, through discrete components in real Bell 212A modems and we had very constant delay factors and we could do a really good job. The first thing that happened is people said, let's do a soft modem. And people would, would write modem, a modem thing in software. The problem was that introduced extra noise because you weren't dealing with discrete components anymore that made the time worse. And then the phone company decided stringing copper wire around wasn't any good. They needed to start to digitize it and start throwing things on ATM networks and other fun things that, that cross domain, uh, physical domains from time to time. And the next thing you know... It used to be that NIST ran all of their remote offices by having GPS receivers with high-quality clocks in them and a real copper wire phone line that would phone home once, once a week or once a month and do very fine-grained tuning of the phase lock loop code because they had very good delay characteristics on the phone line and they could do that. They can't use this anymore because modems in America, at least, the phone lines aren't useful for accurate timekeeping because they don't have constant delay. And I remember the first real hint of this that I got was reading the, one of Dave's books about how time works. And he talks about sources of error and how they treat sources of error that are over 10 hertz as drift and sources of noise, of noise that are below 10, that are, are uh, faster than 10 hertz as noise. And as you can begin to identify each one of these sources and compensate for it, the cacophony goes down and your quality of your time gets better and better. And so, you know, this goes to once upon a time, people thought a day was 24 hours long and there were 60 seconds in, a, in an hour and 60 seconds in a minute. And you knew how long 60 seconds was because it was this, you know, hunk of time that you had a, a good handle on. Until your clock started to get good and you realize the earth doesn't rotate at exactly one second, you know, uh, the speed of the earth changes. And so the seconds got so fast, we could detect that the, each day was a little shorter, or a little longer than the one before it. And this is a rat hole. This is a, this is a nest I can dive into for another three minutes if you want me to. 
Yeah, actually, you know, we were, we're we're getting close to the end of the show, and I've got like six other things I still want to talk to you about. But one of them, in fact, was was leap seconds. So uh, continue on and tell me why that's a problem for you. Um, leap seconds are a problem because our clocks are that good, and as as time slows down, as the as the rotation of the Earth slows down, you eventually have to add a second to make sure that that the zero degrees longitude stays where it's supposed to be. And without leap seconds, your zero degree longitude line moves by about a football field every year closer to Paris. And on the one hand, people say, well, that doesn't matter. We've got satellites for navigation, except all it's going to take is one good solar flare. And there's going to be a hunk of time where, where satellite navigation will be unusable because you won't be able to get through the signal. And if you can't navigate, and now that they've stopped teaching celestial navigation to pilots and ship folks, um, you know, this is a big deal because if you can't navigate your ship or your plane, people are going to die, which on the one hand is bad. What's actually worse is when people die like that, people get sued. And sadly, it seems it seems sadly to me, the reason why these things happen is because of money, not so much because people die. Okay, okay. So what actually, oh, I, don't, I don't know if I want to get, I want, I've got five more questions I still want to ask, but now I'm, I'm curious. So what actually happens to like the GPS time when the leap second is inserted? Does it, does it add a 61st second somehow or does it go from 60 or 59 to zero? And slow it down or something. Like? Okay. Okay. So yeah. there's there's more time scales than you would than you could ever imagine in your life. And I think if you go to leapseconds.com, uh, mm -hmm. this I don't know if I sent this one to you. I'll take care of it. There's yeah. going to be a section there about all the different time scales, and these are things that people actually care about and are vitally important to them because they had people pay them money to fix them because they were real problems. TAI is a time scale that. Uh, does not include leap seconds. It's based on the SI second. So it advances continuously. The trick is we don't run our lives on TAI because the Earth is slowing down little bits. And so every once in a while, in order to keep um, UTC matching TAI, and I'm probably not using the, the absolute correct terminology here. Thank you. That's perfect. Um, we've got to add in a leap second to keep to keep the meridian within a single uh to, uh, to keep it within a single second of, of coordinated universal time. And so when a leap second happens, we adjust our clocks here for universal time. Uh, TAI doesn't matter. It just counts monotonic seconds going forward. And the problem is adding a leap second makes the day longer, which if you aren't careful and most folks aren't, they just step the clock backwards. And while that's ordinarily not a problem for database systems, that's fatal. So there are certain applications that cannot handle a backward step in time. And so for those, you've got to find some other way to do it. And I'm going to do this. I think the very best thing we could do is every two months, we either add or delete a leap second. And that way we're rotating time around coordinated universe. You know, we're, we're keeping the time still within a second either way, but it's just going to work. And if they happen often enough, we'll make sure the software works. And I bet within a few months, people just have this down. And I mean, we never really, how many programmers who are the, who, who remember uh, leap years um, knew that they just had to do a modulo four thing and they didn't really check to, for the hundred year and the 400 year uh, correction or uh, yeah, the, the, the various different corrections, for, you know, 100 year, 400 year, whatever, until Y2K came around and people had the internet and you could go ahead and copy paste proper leap year code. Until we have a useful way to go ahead and do this, we're not going to fix the leap second problem either. And I just realized I could start talking about the general timestamp API for a while now, but we probably don't have time. <laughs> It's right. Time is a limited thing for all of us, and, and we are getting pretty close to to my at least my soft deadline. So uh, I do want to ask a couple more questions. Maybe we we'll come back to the timestamp thing in this, if we get through these uh, fairly quickly. Uh, when I start up a new Unix system, install a new Unix system, I look at etc. ntp.conf, and what I often see in there is pool.ntp.org. What is that, and what is it actually doing for me? Um. People realized that it was becoming kind of difficult to nose around the internet and find different servers you could talk to. And, ask, and a bunch of folks 
and now I'm embarrassed that I don't remember who was doing this back in the original early days because I know Ask is doing it now. Um, the current maintainer, and I really do apologize for not having that, but if I start typing here, you guys are going to be staring at my head doing this while I type, <laughs> and nobody really wants to do that. Yeah. So uh, the current maintainer of the pool project is Ask Bjorn Hansen, and he set up a DNS system where you register your device with the pool project, and they do some sanity tech checks on it and they put it into their DNS system. So if you just check pool. You know, one of the pool servers at pool.ntp.org and just don't go running off there because if you look it up on the web, you're going to get some arbitrary website where the clock is running, not the website of the pool project. And um, it's a convenient way to start getting a bunch of NTP servers without knowing what's going on. The trick is this very quickly turns into how do you use this properly and effectively to make sure that you're doing the right thing. And you don't want to be doing things like what various other folks have done where they'll hard code somebody's time server into their config file. And the next thing you know, you're killing them with traffic from all around the world that they're paying for, which has happened several times in the past. So the short answer is people use the pool project to try and offer uh, time service to a, a group of their stuff. So there's a, a vendor pool. So you could have, you know, froboz.pool.ntp.org and that would offer all the froboz people a chance to go find servers that are designed to work well for them. Yeah, and I also want to make sure that uh, it's it's clear here. There are geolocated servers. At least they know where the, the yes. rough rough geolocation is of those servers. And so, like in the U.S., you're likely to get servers that are in the U.S. If you're in France, you're likely to get servers that are in France. And the way it works is because that DNS server is not just a dumb DNS server. It's actually paying attention to the, your source IP address, and it geolocates that and gives similar servers. Is that that's accurate? Yes. Right? That's okay, accurate, cool. and it's and it and it's a step in the right direction. But it's also a it's a step forward, and in, I won't say a step backwards. But depending on network connectivity, just because a server is is next door to you doesn't mean that that's the shortest hop network wise. Sure, sure, yeah, I, that's completely understood. And it's really, an, probably an almost unsolvable problem, uh, especially as networks and get bigger and well, weirder and things like it's, that. It's unsolvable today, but you know. 20 years ago, getting the clock right to a tenth of a second was a major deal, and now we routinely get it down to a millisecond, and if you're on a LAN, you can, you can do better than that. So it's, awesome. only, it's only difficult right now. We've had a number of questions from our chat room relating to security. Can you tell me a little bit about the security of NTP? Can I actually trust those packets that are going to do reasonable things for me, and uh, how can I tell the bad guys? Um, for the longest running and... The short answer is, of course, we can be doing better. The longer answer is if you go and you, and you start looking up how many CVEs have been registered against a bunch of complaints, before, uh, before last December, there were about a handful of, of CVEs issued for NTP over the 20-year history. Mm. I don't think we've ever had a CVE opened against, for example, a reference clock driver. Um, last fall, some researchers took a hard look at the auto key uh, protocol, which was which was an informational standard and was never recommended for production, and discovered there were problems not only with the protocol, but there were some problems with the implementation. And so we fixed four or five bugs with AutoKey. And there's, you know, been a couple of nits as people dig into this and find more of them. So the short answer is that's one area where there have been some issues with NTP. The other issue is... Um, NTP is the sort of thing the folks who do all the dirty work get to mess with. And there are protocols to let people say, how well is your NTP server hand behaving? The trick is everybody ignored those until a few years ago when somebody discovered that bad guys can launch distributed denial of service attacks using NTP debug information. And that was horrible. So we went ahead and we but before that had happened, we'd already made sure that for people who upgraded their software, there was a, a nonce required to make sure you couldn't just launch a denial of service attack with, with the really major offenders there. But there's so many people who don't who say NTP runs well enough, why should I fix it? They ran the old software, which meant life was miserable. So on the one hand, we're victims of our success. The protocol runs so well, people don't upgrade it. And they don't care enough, and since nobody wants to implement BCP38, because as far as they're concerned, 
I'm trying to watch my language. Um, I'll just go ahead and say there are people who still believe it's fine to litter because if, if litter comes from me, um, well, I don't see it. it. It affects the problem everybody throws it at. And if that's the sort of world you want to live in, that's great. Um, I would much rather live in a world that looks more like Star Trek than Mad Max. So I'd really like it if people would upgrade their NTP software so that these pro so that these problems don't happen and people can't you know do drive-bys and other horrible things using old software. That was a great answer. Thank you. Um, one, one of the other things is I was researching for this show over the last couple of days is I saw that uh, Google doesn't use NTP. They invented their own protocol. Can you tell us a little bit about that? To my understanding, Google is, pro is using NTP. They just decided they wanted to smear the leap second uh, because it was Google does money around fractions of a second. And if things have leap seconds going on, it makes it makes a big jump and everything goes nuts. So they decided the better answer to this was to take a leap second and smear it over the, over a period of time. And they've been now through two iterations of this. The first iteration, they start smearing the leap second early on the day of the leap. And they were doing a cosine uh, application. So there was a nice smooth curve. And uh, that meant that by effectively noon on the day of the leap second, their clocks had already applied half of it. And at 11, you know, at 23.59.59, they were already almost a full second ahead. So when it came time to do 23.59.60, that was the right second for them, and they just moved forward, and the clocks were synchronized. Mm. Now, this last one, they decided two things. One of them was they weren't going to use a cosine transformation anymore because that involves a changing phase adjustment to time, which does horrible things if you're trying to keep your, your kernel synchronized by tracking frequency. It's much better to have an abrupt change in frequency than something that runs smooth. Mm -hmm. um, and the other thing they did is they apply half the, t half the correction the day of the leap second and the other half the next day, which means their clocks are now never off by more than a half a second from everybody else's. Oh, that's very cool. And uh, you also mentioned something in your notes to me about a time card stamping machine incident. Can you uh, go into that? Oh, uh, <laughs> the short answer is I don't remember exactly which one you meant. Okay. So, um, <laughs> we'll, we'll skip that. Let's, I, I, let's okay, just move on. fair enough. Yeah. Um, uh, so, one of the places that time is uh, being used is in the uh, International Space Station, and I presume they're using some sort of NTP, but they're moving at relativistic speeds. I know that GPS satellites have to take that into consideration. So, does it does it is it constantly slewing or something to keep the the time synchronized? I don't know, and that's because I work on a piece of this. I can tell you that when they launched the GPS satellites, they originally knew they had to do, they account for the general theory of relativity for sending something up that high. And as they ran their tests, they also discovered they have to make the other adjustment for special relativity. And they do so. That both of those did work. Do are real. I mean, they proved that they had to do them to keep the GPS clocks working. And so I'm sure that they compensate for that in the space station the same way they have to do it uh, for satellites that are moving around out there that have different delay characteristics because they're moving at a you know relatively constant velocity away from us. So there's Doppler shifts and you know that when you send something, it's going to arrive sooner than when the answer comes back to you because they're going to be that much farther away and the amount they're going away goes farther and farther every time. Um, so I can't really tell you more about the ISS relativity thing there. I can slip in that they run Martian standard time and the scientists like to use a 24-hour day on Mars, except the day on Mars is 39 minutes longer. So every day the the guys who show up at, at their work to do the experiment show up 39 minutes later because it's important that the clocks are all right and you care what time it is because that shows which direction you're pointing because you have to make sure your antenna is pointing at the right thing at the right time. And so they have to synchronize their clocks between our time and Martian standard time. And that's another whole fun thing to deal with. <laughs> yeah, when we I had the Mars rover drivers on uh, a show about five or six years ago, and he talked about that very thing. And he said they, it would be really cool if they just put the entire uh, Mars team on a cruise ship and just keep going further and further. I think it was west, and it'll be just right. Uh, yes, <laughs> I think so. Yes, yes. 
that it's, we, the sun would be the same as where it is on Mars. So for them, relatively, <laughs> they couldn't afford the cruise ship, apparently. So they're stuck <laughs> with their clock instead. And that's as good as it gets there. Um, uh, just briefly, like we're almost we're almost up against a hard deadline here. So just briefly, you mentioned Network Time Foundation briefly, but there's more projects in that than just NTP. Can you give me like a 30 second summary of what some of the other projects are? Sure. Um, we've got uh, uh, the first set of folks I called were, were George Neville Neal with PTPD, a portable open source PTP package. Then I called, uh, then I talked to Richard Cochran from the Linux PTP project. Uh, Richard's effort is designed to be the best possible PTP client on the latest version of the Linux kernel. Uh, I talked to uh, Dr. Julian Rudeau and some of his team from Radclock down under because they were taking a brand new fresh look at all the time time algorithms and the time mechanisms on computers, and we're talking to them. And then, let's see, uh, Paul Henning Camp is working on NTIMED. He's one of the few people I would trust to do a ground-up re-implementation of NTP, and he's already he's already got the .9 release of his LEAF client, which is a client-only standalone version. And other the only other projects that I can think of in Network Time Foundation uh, would include things like the general timestamp API because we've been living with short timestamps forever and they don't have enough information to be useful. They don't include error bounds or maximum error or the time scale you're in or what your known offset is or a bunch of other really critical things you got to know with a timestamp. And we don't live... We don't live in a world anymore where, where you know, four bytes or eight bytes of a timestamp is is a huge amount of data, and we can't afford to know more about it. And we're also looking at certification and compliance programs because people screw stuff up with time all the time, and it costs them money. So if we can come up with ways to have people have better time, where they can defend their use of timestamps in court, it saves them money, and it does, and it can make dramatic improvements in things like healthcare. If you know that somebody. If you know the timestamp when somebody got a med and had a reaction and you know which one came first, it's use, that's very useful data to have when data mining. And um, since I'm staring at this instead of my computer terminal, I, you know, I think that's about it for the projects. But there's a nice list of projects at nwtime.org that will show you the projects that, that we're working with and moving forward on. Wonderful. Nice summary. Just three more questions and I'll get rid of you here. Get, get, get out of there. So um, I, I have to ask this or I get emails. I really seriously get emails. What's your favorite text editor? I use both VI and Emacs and I switch between Ooh. them easily. Wow. Bilingual. All right. <laughs> if, you know, if, if I've got to bang something out in a hurry, it's VI. If I need to... If I have to do any, I mean, I read all my email using MHE and I do all my nasty edits using Emacs uh, and I'm perfectly happy switching back and forth between them. We, I'm happy to go into that more, but we're tight on time because there's a fun <laughs> yes, story exactly. there. Oh, wonderful. Mm -hmm. Oh, I wish I was asked that earlier then. I'm still looking at seven more questions I wanted to ask you. Uh, my second of the last three questions is what's your favorite scripting language? I'm... I'm just going to say Perl, and okay. I'm, I'm so good with really ancient shell that my my scripts run on everything, including old Ultrix and old Sun OS. And as soon as I have to do shell and grep or shell and awk or shell and anything else, I stop and I write it in Perl. Awesome, awesome. We are such kindred guys. This is really... <laughs> I'm to think geek heaven now. This is great. And my third question and final question before we have to let you go is, what time is it? <laughs> on my Hamilton watch, it says where I am, it's 9.07. Okay, let me set my computer. <laughs> Hold on. Thank you for that. Oh, my God. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> <laughs> oh, man. I wish, I, wish, I wish we had another hour. Maybe we'll have to bring you back in about six months. You can talk about what else is happening, especially the, the new time D thing. That sounds like it might be for asking. We'll bring you on and, and the uh, Paul, was it, that uh, is working on that. Oh, yeah, oh that man. It's yeah, it's been such a pleasure, uh, such a pleasure, but i got to let you go. we got to some of the wind-down stuff before we hit our hard deadline. So thank you very much uh, uh, for coming on the show today, Harlan, and just maxing out the geek scale. <laughs> this has been the geekiest mm -hmm. show ever. Thank you very much for being on the show. Oh, excellent. Thank you, Randall. Very good. That was Harlan Sten, who maxed the geek. He met Father Time. He basically took us all mm -hmm. the way through everything about telling time. What would you think, Dan? 
it, fascinating, yeah. And, and I just didn't realize how much work goes into this. I don't think any of us quite did. Um, yeah. yeah, we definitely all take it for granted. Uh, it's a bit ironic that we ran out of time, though, isn't it? Uh, that has to be... <laughs> Yeah, it's, it's like that sometimes. It's a bit meta. Is it meta <laughs> or something? Just, Maybe it's meta. We're almost slightly over, actually, so I better hurry up and uh, wrap mm. this up because I know I don't like listening to shows anywhere that are longer than an hour, so I really try to keep uh, careful that this, this show stays within that uh, ball frame. But ball frame? What the heck is that? They let anybody do this show. Ball frame. All right. Uh, so let's talk about the upcoming guests we have on the schedule right now. And the schedule's practically full all the way up to the end of Q3, so I'm opening up Q4 this weekend. I always say that and then wait three more weeks before I do it. But yes, I'm opening up Q4. We have a couple of people that are chomping at the bits, ready to get on the schedule. So I just need to uh, get that done. But next week, we'll have Kubernetes, which is Google's cluster management software uh, for containers. We have... FWNOP. I've been told to pronounce this FWKNOP. It's a port knocking next generation application, single packet authorization. We have Gombas, which is a free object oriented basic inspired by Visual Basic. We have Ichinga. I said earlier that we're going to have Nagios coming on, but we're not. We're having the fork of Nagios called Ichinga, which is a scalable and extensible monitoring system. Uh, we have Dart. I'm looking forward very much to that show because I'm starting to be more of a Dart expert these days and actually writing uh, production code in Dart. Uh, we'll have Casper Lund, who's one of the uh, project leads, uh, one of the key designers, and Anders. Sandholm, who I forgot his role, something about community relations or something like that. Uh, you can see all those at twit.tv slash floss. There's a spreadsheet linked from there that has all our upcoming guests and uh, also people we're, we're talking to. If you have a guest that's not on that list or some potential guest that's not on the list, please have the project leader or community coordinator email me, Merlin at stunnage.com and I will get them on the very short list probably as soon as we open Q4. They can drop a slot right in Q4. We have a live stream for this show. Uh, 8 a.m. Pacific time is when we tape on Wednesdays and you can go to live.com Twit.tv. We had a number of questions on this show, uh, show which I, I sort of expected. You can follow us on Floss Weekly on Google+. Plus. Yes, we're still on Google+. Plus. Yes, that's that's my network of choice, even though it's being dissed by all these people out there. No, Google+, Plus rocks. Come on, guys. Go back to Google+. Plus. Uh, and we're also uh, mirrored to at Floss Weekly on Twitter. You can follow me at Merlin, M-E-R-L-Y-N, on Twitter, but primarily my content is still being driven on Google+, Plus is Randall L. Schwartz. Uh, I don't have much to plug this time. Good, because we're almost out of time. Uh, but I will be at DragonCon for Labor Day weekend. That's a giant show that gets about 30,000 attendees, 40,000. That's how you count them. And there's about 400 guests. So are special people, uh, well, not that kind of special people, but uh, I'm one of the guests again this year for about the uh, 12th out of the last 13 years. I am speaking on Ingress, this new thing out of Google. Lots of Google things here today. Uh, I'm also going to be on a panel about privacy and using PGP about that. Uh, and I'm also going to be in the traditional Hacking 101 and 201 where we uh, the guest asks us anything and they've gotten pretty wild occasionally and the things they're asking us about. Uh, uh, that's my only scheduled event through the end of the year. So uh, I'm going to be like nothing to plug after this. But uh, uh, Dan, you want to plug some stuff? Uh, just, just very quickly, yeah. Um, I mentioned it last time I was on, but um, I'm in the process of organizing another OG Camp, which is the largest free software and free culture event in the UK. If you want to find out more, go to oggcamp.org, ogcamp.org. And uh, I think that's about it. And I'm going to do, uh, hopefully, while I'm away, till the end, I'm in France till the end of next week, I'm going to do some writing while I'm here. So there may be some st new stuff to read. And uh, I think that's about it. So just go to danlynch.org. You can find all that there. Very cool, very cool. Well, man, we're out of time on a show about time. <laughs> mm -hmm. Ironically so. Yes, you wasted a perfectly good hour listening to Randall talk. <laughs> Listen to Floss talk. <laughs> I, I totally mm -hmm. flubbed what I was going to do for, as, a, as a mimic there, but that's okay. Anyway, uh, Dan, thanks again for uh, co-hosting for me, even from uh, breaking up some of your vacation time. Yeah, no problem. And the network stayed up, so vive la yeah. France. What can I say? <laughs> okay, very good. And we'll see you all again next week on Floss Weekly. Floss Weekly.